Today I have with me Dan Van Rossum, the Chief Experience Officer of Dreamplex. I'm going to let Dan talk a little bit about himself. So I'll talk about myself? Yeah. Huh. Terrible. I hate doing that. So, hello, Tuan. Nice to be here. So, uh, yes, I'm Dan. You actually pronounced my name very well. I'm nice. surprised. Um, so I work for Dreamplex. I'm Chief Experience Officer. Um, which basically means that we're looking at what it's, what it's like to come to work um, and how can we make it better. Um, and we do that for about 200 companies here in Vietnam. Um, before I did that, I was in another mad job <laughs> because I used to work for Ogilvy uh, for about 10 years uh, across Amsterdam, where I'm from. And then I moved to New York, uh, Chicago, Singapore, and then finally Saigon. Cool. Um, Dan, there's a question that um, we want to ask what every guest that come through here because a lot of our audiences are about early 20s to, to um, early 30s, you know, trying to figure out in their career where they're going to mm. go. Um, so a lot of people want to know how you got into your uh, first job, uh, who gave you your first break, where hmm. it is, and how that, how that affected you uh, versus where you are today. Okay. So please don't follow my path. Don't follow my advice. <laughs> so basically, uh, I dropped out of high school when I was 15 years old. Um, I was really tired of sitting in uh, the school and learning. Um, it's not something that really fit with me. And um, I just applied for random jobs and uh, eventually landed something that I felt was quite interesting. Um, following that, I went to an internet startup really focused on content marketing. And then eventually, I transitioned to, uh, to Ogilvy in Amsterdam. Um, I would say that basically my first break was to land there, obviously, because they took someone without any degree, uh, without any diploma, and, and took me in and kind of like grew me from there. I would say probably my first big break was uh, winning a, a talent competition that Ogilvy did internally. Um, and that landed me a job at their headquarters in New York, um, where I kind of moved from doing kind of creative tech content work in Amsterdam to becoming a digital strategist. And especially at that time, that kind of meant, you know, working with companies like uh, Ford and Ikea and American Express, like big Fortune 500 companies to help them figure out what to do online. That was the big, the big question back then. Nice. So how we're now talking is like, oh, how does this whole like social media thing work? And like, should we be on TikTok or not? Back then it was really like, should we build a microsite or not? Um, <laughs> how do we do CRM? Like, how do we get people to, you know, leave us their email address so we can market to them? Yeah. Uh, stuff like that. So good old days, right? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> the good old days, yeah. So, so I think that was, I, I would consider like my first uh, big break. And obviously, again, there's people there who took a huge risk taking some crazy Dutch kid with, again, no degree, no nothing, and giving me a platform, you know, to, to grow and to meet these really senior people and to present to really big companies. Um, so I would say that those are like two really big things uh, that, that happened, yeah. Nice. What was the talent show? So it was a competition for, I think, when they turned 60, um, and they were kind of reinventing, like, what should Ogilvy look like in the future? And so they kind of open it up for anyone around the world to submit an essay about what creativity means and what it should mean in the future. Um, I wrote an essay with uh, a lot of help, I can now say, since it's been submitted <laughs> and already landed the job, about the, we call it the what if solution. So it was all about, you know, questioning the status quo. And instead of like going for maybe your first idea, your mm -hmm. first creative concept, like challenging it and saying, well, what if we do this? What if we make it better? What if we do it even crazier? Uh, and that was reviewed by, you know, the, the, the global chief creativity officer, what are they called? CCO. CCO. Yeah. Let's just call CCO, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and eventually they, they picked 10 people from, from all over the world and brought them to Istanbul, where, they, where there was like a big conference and where we presented to the global leadership, which was terrifying. Nice. And you had help? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there were some, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say like my English was good enough to like I write see, like I a see. really nice essay. So there yeah. was a creative director called Chris Jones, yeah, okay. who was from the UK and Hi, he was Chris. there. Hey, yeah. Chris. Uh, thanks again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he definitely did some, um, let's say, editing on the article. Nice. Knowing what you know now, because you've been, you've progressed quite far in your career. Knowing what you know now... Are you now, saying I'm old? No, no, no. I'm saying you're <laughs> Which, accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing what you know now, would you do it all over again? Yeah, for sure. Same path? Or mm. would you skip everything and jump straight mm. to Amsterdam? Same path. Mm. Very cool. So today in the show, um, Dan had 
uh, hosted a few seminars and talks about this topic called the future of work, mm. which uh, I thought was very, very interesting. So I invited Dan here today to share with us what that means from his point of view, and then uh, we can go from there. Sure. So should I give you my definition or kind of like yeah, what is point? what is the future of work? So the future of work really is one key question, which is that I think that the current model is broken. I think that a lot of people, especially in Vietnam, they come to work to make a living. Uh, they come there for the paycheck. There's a lot of companies who are still doing fingerprint scanner in in the morning, fingerprint scanner out at night. It has nothing to do with intrinsically being motivated to be part of something bigger in, in terms of delivering something interesting. And I therefore think the outputs are typically also not quite as good, right? Because yeah. you're kind of just sitting there doing, doing your job so you can get paid at the end of the month. And so companies are often asking themselves the question, like, how do I get the best talent? How do I keep them there? And then how do I get the most out of them? And I think when we're talking about the future of work, we have to kind of ask that question, like, why is work so terrible, yeah. right? If you're not someone who, someone who works at lab or at Viet Cetera, right? Why is work something that you feel like you just have to do, right? Why is it something you have to endure rather than enjoy? And so that's really our starting point to say, when we look at the best companies in the world and the places where people really enjoy working, what are those ingredients that make it a great place to work? And how can we make that a platform that any company can tap into? And so it really is a design question, right? It really goes through the whole process of sort mm -hmm. of just completely challenging that idea of what work is from the place you sit in to the way your manager treats you to maybe the overall company culture, break it down and say, how could we make it better? Does it apply for every industry or only the cool, sexy tech design? <laughs> like, let's say I work in construction. Uh -huh. Does your thesis hold? So that's the interesting thing, right? People kind of often jump to, oh, it's only like the Googles of the world that deliver a great work experience, which is obviously not true. Yeah. There's really big corporate companies in all kinds of different sectors that are doing a great job at bringing people in. Um, I used to work uh, through Ogilvy for Kimberly Clark. I mean, they make diapers yeah. and sanitary napkins. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not the first thing you're thinking about, like, oh, my dream job would be to like market yeah. that or like produce that. Yeah. But you know, they build a culture. They use those same principles to basically think about like what would make people feel engaged, excited to come to work. And so it definitely applies across industries as long as you go back to the key question, which is who are these people that either I want or I have. And how do I get them to be super engaged and super interested and super excited to work here? And is it also reserved for companies with a certain level of investment? Can a startup or can a solo entrepreneur build on your thesis and create a great work environment if they don't have the money, if they don't have the facilities? Would you consider yourself a startup? Uh, not in the tech sense. Like I'm, we're not going to mm -hmm. scale a thousand percent overnight. Um, but a startup in the sense that we're young. Right, yeah. right. So you have the same challenge, which is that you're just starting to figure this out, right? Yeah. And like now you're, you're a few years into it. But when you first started, you know, you get together a group of people. It's built around a certain vision, around a certain purpose. And you're, you're constantly thinking about how do I get these people to really be part of it, you know? And not just do the job I tell them to do, but feel kind of like, again, intrinsically motivated to do that job and to create something great together. Um, there's all, all, all kinds of principles, like, you know, maybe the physical surrounding needs to be comfortable enough or interesting enough to kind of feel nice to come back to every day. Um, there are things like recognition. Um, you know, how do you make sure that people who do a great job get recognized? Um, how do you invest in people's growth and development? How do you make sure that there's every now and then a chance to let off steam? None of these things really cost money. None of these things really are specific to certain industries or certain types of companies. Mm. Um, so I would say very much, any startup or any smaller company, or even when you're just one or two people, you can start thinking through some of these principles uh, in the domain we call employee experience and apply them to your company. And let's say in the hierarchy of priorities for an executive, right? Mm. I have my finances, I have my marketing, I have the day-to-day -day operation. How far up is employee experience for you? Should be number one. Number one? So we talked briefly <laughs> before we, 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 we started, right? We yeah. talked briefly. You know, a company is nothing but the people in it. Yeah. There is nothing else beyond, you know, maybe an Uber. Yeah, they have a cool app or a cool tech platform and they have a lot of IP, right? But at the end of the day, if there are no people at this point in time, maybe 50 years from now, different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At this point in time, if there are no people who are engaged and are excited to bring that platform to the world and make it work and do the operations and do everything that's needed to, to make it a success, then you have nothing. 
Yeah. Right. So companies are only the people and they're as good as their people are. Right. And so I think it should be number one. I think you first and foremost should look at your people um, and then all the other things kind of follow. Let me give you a specific example. Mm. Let's say a, a manager is contemplating whether to give a raise for a particularly um, impressive employee mm. versus taking the money he would have spent on that raise and investing into some kind of culture related thing. Do you think the employee would appreciate the culture stuff or the salary raise more? And is there science <laughs> to back it up? So, so what is your definition of culture stuff in, in uh, that equation? I, I say culture stuff like, um, I didn't mean to dismiss it, but what I mean is let's say like, oh, let's have a, a coffee machine or uh -huh. let's, let's have a yoga class or things like that that uh -huh. are not directly related to money mm -hmm. in the pocket of the employee. Yeah, this is basically kind of like when you're running a country or a company, you're, yeah. you, you have a finite amount of resources, you have a finite amount of money, and you're always puzzling with where is it going to make the biggest impact, yeah. right? And so you would look at that and say, well, is that someone that's otherwise going to leave? Then obviously the money is going to help. But the yeah. question is like, why is that person <laughs> leaving in the first place, right? True. So is it going to help as a blanket statement that, you know, you put in a coffee machine, people stay longer? Probably not. I think coffee machines or an on-site cafe is one of those things that kind of like makes people conflate the, the sort of the symptom or, or the execution of company culture with company culture. Yeah. The coffee machine isn't the culture, but maybe your culture is so that, you know, people work very hard and in the morning they need their coffee. <laughs> yeah. Or it's a specific group of people who really likes it that there's coffee in the morning, you know, and it's not just like typical machine coffee. Yeah. So... It depends. It really depends. <laughs> it really depends. And that's also why I think that you know, younger companies and companies who are just getting into this and especially see that with, you know, founders who assemble, you know, a, a team of maybe four or five people. And it all works perfectly well, right? Because the founder has a great vision and the four or five people probably, they either already knew them or they are hired with that idea in mind and everything works really well. And then when the company becomes more successful and you grow to 15, 20, 30, 50 people, it becomes a very different story because you're kind of detached Let's say if we look at a normal organizational, what's that called? Uh, pyramid? <laughs> org right? org chart. If we look at a normal org chart, yeah. right? You, you kind of know that the people at the bottom, yeah. so like the most junior people, are like every level that they're removed from the founder and the original vision, they're less maybe motivated, maybe less you know, excited to be part of their company. It just becomes more of a job. Mm. And to pass on that idea of why was that founder originally so excited about that company, that is really the art. And so I think that a lot of companies, when they're scaling, they start running into these issues of like, oh, it's really not that easy anymore to motivate my people because I don't just have five people in a room. I have people sitting maybe in different offices, different locations, right? People talk about working from home. How do you motivate people mm. when you're not even sitting in the same space anymore? So then you really get into the art and the science of employee experience. You really need to start thinking about how do I do this? And that's why when companies grow, they start hiring strategic HR talent. Yeah. You know, you hire a really great HR director who understands people. Um, I don't think there are many in Vietnam, but I know, for example, Sakshi at Tiki, yeah. actually a chief people officer, you know, someone yeah. who is just dedicated to the people. And what do we need to do to make it a great environment for them? But it's, yeah. it's very challenging. Yeah, I guess the gist of that is that it, it depends on, on your stage, mm -hmm. right? Where, where you should put your focus and investment, right? But so, so how, yeah. how big is your team, if I can ask the counter question? <laughs> Our team is 30 right 30 now, um, full-time, mm -hmm. and we have about 110 uh, mm -hmm. part-time right. in our cafes. And yeah. how do you make sure that, you know, like no matter whether they are a part-time or working in a cafe or someone who's been with you for five years in, the, let's say, the head office, yeah. how, do they, how, how do they, you know, how do you make sure that they're equally engaged? That dynamic that you mentioned in the beginning, whereby the founder and mm. his four or five co-founders, we try to replicate that um, at scale. Mm. So I sit among the staff, um, I cross pollinate, like I'll go to their events, mm. you know, like if they're like just like, you know, the cafe staff, I would still go to somebody's birthday, mm. for example. And Laura, my co-founder, is also doing the same mm. on the reverse side. So we try to replicate that dynamic. So you don't feel like you're at the bottom of the pyramid. Right. You feel like you're up there as well. Mm. Or at least I'm down there as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. So we try to replicate that dynamic. I think that's right. the core of it. Yeah. And then everything else, like the coffee machine, all those things are kind of there to facilitate that. Exactly. Like I can have coffee with them. 
it's like an extra tool that you can have, yeah. right? And I think that's why, you know, when you're running teams at scale mm -hmm. and when you're running bigger companies, right, this becomes the key challenge, which yeah. is that how do I create something that when people hear about it or when they read the Notion page in your example, <laughs> yeah. that they feel like, wow, that's a place I want to work. Mm -hmm. That's not many companies can say that, right? Yeah. Not many, sorry, not many companies can say that. That someone would just hear about the company is like, wow, that's a great place to work. Other than positions, title, salary, yeah. right? And then how do you retain those people? So how do you make sure that someone is not just excited on day one, that's true. but is equally excited to be there in month six and month 12? And again, we're talking about people. So it's not only what you're doing as the employer or as the company, you're also talking about people who are going through their own ups and downs and they have their own shit going on yeah. in, their, in their private life, right? And then the final one, which is really about, I think what employers care about maybe the most, which is how do I get the most value out of them? Yeah. Or set maybe in a nicer way. Yeah, but how do how I, I get extract value. right? How do I get the most productivity, the most creativity, the most collaboration out of out of these people? Right? And that's typically what a company owner would look at. Yeah. And would think, how do I how do I make this work? Because you have the vision. Right. And if you look at like very, very old, like management literature, management is nothing more than getting things done through other people. Yeah. Because you cannot do the work by yourself. Right. Yeah. You, you cannot be behind every single uh, coffee machine. Yeah. <laughs> pouring coffees and then also run the company and also go to new business meetings. Yeah. So you need other people. So that's that's what you're looking into. Right. Like, how do I how do I make this work? Yeah. So that's why you see, even though we you know, maybe we run offices, right? Or I would say work experience, workplace experiences. Yeah. But when the conversation takes a turn to the stuff that matters, it's always about people. Yeah. It's always about culture. It's always about understanding the people that work for you well enough to decide what to do. And that's why I think it really depends, you know, what, where is the value created the most when you're talking about, do I give someone a raise or do I get the coffee machine? Yeah. It's really all about, well, do you understand your people? Right, so how many companies can say that they constantly listen to people? Or are they still stuck in the era where every six months, or every 12 months, you would have a performance review? Yeah. And you would sit across the table from someone and say, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So let's say somebody going through all these steps to create a great employee um, engagement or employee experience mm -hmm. program, do you still think that Vietnam has um, challenges with recruiting, retaining, and developing talent mm -hmm. as opposed to other countries that you've been in? So I've only done this in Vietnam. So every okay. experience that I have is from being an employee in other countries. Yeah. And of course, I worked for a huge company and they know, right? The bigger your company gets, the more you see the bottom line picture of if I don't invest in my people, it's going to cost me a lot. Yeah because nothing costs more money than losing the best talents and having to rehire for that, right? And then like retrain. Mm -hmm. So I can only see it from that perspective. And again, I was in organizations that, you know, did I think a really good job at doing employee experience and making people feel motivated. I mean, I still left that job, so <laughs> <laughs> clearly yeah. not a perfect job, but it maybe just be me, right? Yeah. I think what I see in my day to day, I don't want to pin this on Vietnam, mm -hmm. right? But what I see in my day to day is that yeah, this is generally an area where most companies are not, you know, they're not super good at it. It's something that no one was hired typically at a company under three, 400 people. No one was hired to think about what is it like to work here, right? There's a boss and there's managers and there is support staff, but typically you don't have someone who is just focused on what will it be like to work here every single day and how do you keep people and how do you get them to be as productive and collaborative and creative as possible. So because that isn't there, then of course, you know, companies run into these issues where you suffer because you don't retain your people or you're, you have a lot of people, but you don't get the outputs that you want. Mm. Okay. So you, you think it's a, an issue with awareness from the company side, would you say? Is it an awareness issue? Probably they're aware of the problem, mm. but I think a lot of companies haven't made the leap yet to how do we solve that? And I think that's, you know, for our discussion today, right? We're yeah. talking about design. Yeah. So a lot of this really goes back to basic design thinking or basic design process, which is you have a problem, for example, retention, right? Maybe too many people leave 
to another cool company, yeah. right? Which we see all the time. Mm. So maybe that's your problem. So how would you solve it, right? Like as a designer, you would probably do the IDO double diamond or something like yeah. that. And you start thinking about like, what are all the possible ways you could solve that problem, right? Yeah. And then you go down to like, well, how should we solve it? So maybe certain things sound really interesting, but they're extremely expensive to implement. Or maybe there's like a huge organizational barrier to do it. So you find a set of solutions that work for you. And that's why, even though there are principles, that's why it's an art and a science. Yeah. Amply experience, while there are principles, it really is different for every company because every company has, they're at a different stage. They maybe have very specific issues. And so what works for one company won't always work for another company, which is typically mm. like in marketing, for example, yeah, where yeah, I would true. hire an expert to come in and say, well, what would work for you? Yeah. In this next section, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions, and okay. I don't I don't want you to think about it. <laughs> I just want you to answer, and then I've not been th thinking the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end, we'll give you a chance to qualify a few. Okay. And expand on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, or take back whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's a rapid fire session. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, a staff consistently comes too late. What do you do? Talk. Remote work, yes or no? Yes. Local versus international talent? Local. Carrot or stick? Carrot, for sure. Saigon or Hanoi? Saigon. Uniqlo or Muji? <laughs> Sorry, Hanoi team. <laughs> <laughs> Uniqlo or Muji? Uniqlo. Money or passion? Passion. Start your own business or join a company? Join a company. Join a startup or an established company? Join a startup. <laughs> <laughs> TikTok or Instagram? TikTok. Biden or Trump? Don't think, man. <laughs> Take back. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of some, like pause music. <laughs> yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Do I have to answer that? You do not have to answer that. Great. Skip. Okay. Good. <laughs> I'm not involved in U.S. politics. So <laughs> I'm staying far away from that. That's very interesting. Hmm. Um, you said local uh, versus international talent. You said you chose local. Hmm. You are an international talent. I mean, I'm international. I don't, yeah. I don't know about the second part, but yes. So is there a discrepancy there? Do you want to expand on that? Like if you say local talents, you would prefer local talents over international talent. For so sure. Yeah. So why would a company hire an expert like yourself you know, to, to be in their firm? So this really comes down to what's available in the local market from kind of a knowledge and experience perspective and what isn't. So I would say you typically go outside when you're trying to hire something that isn't available in the market because maybe no one learned that, you know, maybe no one has garnered that experience so far. And so that's maybe where you would go for an expat or an international rights uh, uh, resource which in our case could be in the region, right? So it doesn't always have to be some yeah, white sure. person like me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be VQ or, you know, like yes. bicultural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so I think when the, the knowledge or the experience you're seeking for isn't available in the local market, you would look outside. But at the end of the day, you know, when I just look at our case, right, we're designing an experience for young Vietnamese. doesn't make much sense for me to sit there and say, oh, let me tell you what young Vietnamese like, yeah. right? I think you want to hire people that really represent your target audience. In our case, you know, we design what we do for young Vietnamese between 22 and 30. So those are the people in my team. Yeah. Mm. And you said remote work, yes. Oh, yeah. Does that harm your business model, mm. being from a workplace experience? No, I think, I think the more that companies realize that you know, and this goes back to the conversation about company culture, but the more you realize that company culture isn't sitting in a space together and, oh, that's what retains people because mm -hmm. they come back to the same place and they see their colleagues, right? The moment you sort of like detach from that idea and you let people work how they want, when they want, where they want, I think you're only going to get more engaged employees. And so letting people work from home a couple of days a week, I think, is the only way to do it. And there was research from, from Navigo Search, actually before COVID, that showed that 
working flexibly was the number one on the wish list of <laughs> young Vietnamese. Nice. And I think the reason it was on the wish list is that companies wouldn't allow for it. Companies did not believe that you could have people working from home and still get work done. And I think during the social isolation in April, <coughs> companies saw that actually we functioned really well, even when people were not working in the office. And so I think with that sort of in mind, I now see more companies moving towards a hybrid model where maybe people work from home some days and then sometimes they come to the office. And that actually really, in our case, it really helps us because every single thing that drives companies to be more purposeful about designing a workplace experience is good for us. Yeah. Because then they'll realize that, oh, maybe renting, and sorry to all the commercial real estate brokers <laughs> that we love so dearly, but maybe renting like a huge floor in a grade A building in the central business district doesn't really make sense. Because it really isn't about the physical like office, the reason that people want to come back to work for you. So they will move to maybe, you know, I always call this like quality of work versus quantity of work. Mm. Maybe they'll take a smaller space, but they do so in a building with really cool uh, neighboring companies where, you know, like you get exposed to not just the 30 or 40 people in your company, but all the companies around there. And maybe therefore you can share meeting room space or the cafe or the lounge or that coffee machine you mentioned yeah. with other companies. You don't have to invest in it and you can give that back to your employees, right? The very best example I've seen throughout this entire year was a company in San Francisco that basically said, we're going to cancel our lease. We're not going to have an office anymore, but the few million per year that we pay for that office, we're going to invest it in offsites. Every, so you're going to work from home mm. and every three months, we're going to fly somewhere with the whole team mm -hmm. and have an, a really cool week and just do fun stuff and team bu building and kind of refresh, you know, why we're here together. This is post COVID or pre COVID? Post COVID. Wow. They can fly <laughs> after, US, after yeah. this lift. Right? <laughs> yeah. A lot of our, our, our guests, or uh, sorry, our listeners are aspiring professionals, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. students. And I think a lot of them struggle whether to follow their passion, which may or may not bring them a lot of money. So you said passion. Mm. Is that easy coming from somebody who's already, you know, crossed that bridge? That's what I always say. It's right? easy for me to say you should follow your passion. Yeah. I always think that the people who say, you know, like on, on, on Facebook, on Instagram, you know, do what you love, yeah. follow your passion. They're typically the people who have made their money already yeah, exactly. and are now selling some kind of system, yeah. <laughs> you know. But I just go back to a very simple principle, which is the idea of ikigai, mm. right, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, yeah. It all has to kind of come together. You gave me a binary choice. I don't think the choice is so binary. I think people need to look at all the different elements. So what is something I'm good at? What is something I love doing? What is something I get, get paid for? Mm. And what does the world need? When you combine those four things, you create you know, what the Japanese call ikigai, a reason to get up in the morning. So I think if you're just doing something you love, but you get no money, you'll be quite miserable. When you just do something that makes money and you don't love it at all, you're quite miserable as well. Right? So I think it has, to be somewhere, it has to be somewhere in the middle. So ideally, and this is really much more about getting to know yourself. Right? So when I run these workshops where I sit around the table from people and take them through this process, it's really a function of people starting to be aware of what they even want. They typically don't know what they're passionate about. Usually yeah. their problem is, I'm not passionate about anything. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So how can I do something I'm passionate about if I don't know what who I am or yeah. what my passion is. So I think that's the process. And that's, again, talking as an old person, you know, that's what you kind of have to go through anyway. But the more you can find something that you're passionate about and you're interested in that also kind of pays the bills, the better it is. And I think that's usually more, it's easier to do than most people think. Yeah. But it takes sort of that awareness and the thoughtfulness towards yourself to kind of explore that, you know, what would that thing be that's kind of is on the intersection of those two. Does it take <clears throat> backpacking through a country to find that? Or can you sit down at a workshop and fill it out? Because a lot of people, I think they know that they should find out about what they want. It's just they don't know how to find it, right? So uh, how do you, what advice would you give them for them to mm. try to find it? Yeah, so not like to go full into Buddhism and, you know, everything you need is, 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 is within yourself already. Like I think typically why people immediately think about something like backpacking or traveling. Mm. It's because they're trying to find it outside of themselves, right? So they think that, you know, when I take this huge trip, 
I get exposed to other things and somehow it's gonna wake up you know, what's already there inside. And typically you don't need it. So typically you can actually sit down and ask yourself the questions. But again, it is something that happens over time. I think it is something that kind of like happens when you mature, when you start understanding yourself better. How am I responding to things? What motivates me and what is something that, you know, like I always sort of like uh, procrastinate as long as possible, right? Mm -hmm. The more experience in life you have, the more maybe clear that becomes. Would you say that for yourself, you, you've landed at that point where you kind of have a very clear picture of who you are and that sort of like... <laughs> you mean now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. now I'm quite happy and uh, I basically jump out of bed. Hmm. Um, but I remember a time up until I was 25 where I didn't know what I want to do. Yeah. So, you know, I've heard the stories and I've read, read the books about how to find your passion and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And it always seems to fall on deaf ear because I don't know how to find it. Because mm -hmm. you don't know it until you see it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So but that's, that's also the, the yeah. I think, one of the big things we run into when we talk about can you sit down and just figure it out, yeah. right? Is that people want the immediate solution, mm. right? They kind of sit there and think, I want to know what I'm passionate about. I want to find something that really motivates me, that really drives me. But it's not going to happen that quickly, right? It is a process, right? It is sort of like, uh, as some life coaches would say, life is a series of epiphanies or in the startup way you would say you build and then you measure and then you learn, right? Yeah. So you start with something and you think, oh, that's where I should be going. And then you try that out. And then you either say, yeah, confirm, that's, that's the direction or nope, mm. <laughs> <Oops>. start over. <laughs> that's, that's not it at all, right? And then yeah. you readjust and you create a new hypothesis and then you follow that one until you finally get somewhere like you and me where we wake up happily in the morning Maybe still a bit tired, but that's why we have the coffee. <laughs> we have coffee. Right? This should be coffee, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of future of work, uh, you're about to be a father. I don't know if I can say that on the air. That cool? <laughs> you're about to be a father. Yes. Is your son or daughter? Son. In which world do you think your son will work in, in about 20 years? I have no idea. Any... Any hypothesis about, let's say, physically or virtually, or he'll be replaced by robots? Or I, I hope that he'll be supported by robots, or by at least by AI, right? So there's a famous, so workplace strategists always quote this famous study from McKinsey, which says that at this point in time, 49% of all the work we're doing globally can be replaced by AI. That's current work with current AI technology. Mm. So 20 years into the future, you know, when I talk to my wife about, oh, what school should he go to? Or like, we don't even know if schools are still there, True. right? We don't know like what part of the work gets automated. And I think going back to our discussion today, what is the one thing that so far has not been, how do you say that? It hasn't been able to be replaced by AI, this creativity, is creation. So for sure, I will definitely steer towards creating and having original thoughts and having creative thinking and critical thinking but where that's going to lead <laughs> for what purpose i don't know they might be able to create <coughs> you never know right yeah current ai tech cannot make the leap right but would you say they could in the future for sure that's i mean it also goes back to like what is the definition of creativity and creating mm -hmm. right because mm -hmm. if you look at that really famous maybe from 10 years ago this like youtube series called everything is a remix mm -hmm. you, you must have seen yeah, that right yeah, yeah. So it basically shows that what people think is true creativity was already a variation on something that was created before. Is there actually something that we have created in the last decade that's truly original? Right, that would be the question when we're talking about creativity. Yeah. But that idea of, I was listening to a, an interview with uh, um, the guy from Spotify and he was saying that here's something that currently humans can do and a machine cannot. He was talking about before COVID, they had a really great feature on Spotify called The Drive. And it mixed a bit of music mm. with a bit of talk radio uh, into someone's Spotify list, right? So that idea needs to come from a human. A machine would not have had the understanding mm. that, oh, when our people are in their car, they want to listen to something. Okay, great. That's why we have Spotify. It needs to be some music and some talk. And then what songs are appropriate for singing along in the car and which songs aren't? So he says, that's a uniquely human thing to do to create that concept because it's it's really about understanding people deeply and then creating something based on that 
Now, then he said, the scaling part can 100%, 100% be done by machines yeah. or by AI. So once I have had a human editor basically put together a playlist of 3,000 songs that are great to listen to in the car and to maybe sing along with, it's really not that difficult for an AI to use those 3,000 and use all the current data and pick the next 10,000 songs. That scaling part can be done, but the original concept couldn't be done by an AI. No. Do you need to worry about AI employee experience in the future? Well, I think you know, when you really talk about workplace of the future, yeah, you really have to think about like what is uniquely human and what should people do and how are you supported by software. But I think it's a very gradual process. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not a part where I'm like super expert in, <laughs> but I think okay. it's a gradual process, right? If someone from 20 years ago would travel to today, they would just be amazed by what we have in terms of the tools and the platforms and all the kind of stuff that we don't have to do anymore, right? But it's not like we're sitting here today, it's like, oh my God, the world is changing yeah. so like dramatically. Mm. It's quite doable, right? Does it start scaling at some point where there's a huge delta between what we're able to kind of conceptualize and follow versus what's happening in the world? Yeah, maybe. But let's cross that bridge when we get to it, right? Yeah. I don't look too much into the, even though we talk about the future of work, I think we're talking about, we already know how we can do it better and companies are stuck in the past. I think that's sort of the bridge I'm trying to make, Yeah. right? You look at the best companies in the world and how are they treating their employees and how are they attracting, retaining and engaging their people and how can we apply it to the other 99%? I think that's what I'm talking about. Mm. And then we go into some concepts like, you know, hybrid work, which really isn't something that happened last year. You know, we already know that like th two, three years from now, that will probably be more of a mainstay than it is now. Yeah. So we start to try and make that transition. But the true future is quite unpredictable. That's very eloquently put. That's well, very cool. It's basically just me saying, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's like I said, eloquently put. <laughs> um, before I bring it back uh, home, is there something about um, your vision of the future of work that mm. we haven't covered through our topics? I don't think so. Like, look, I think the one point that we keep getting back to, which is why it's so interesting, right? What I think every designer would find interesting, mm. it's, it's just about people. Mm. The deeper you understand people, the better you can create something that resonates really well with them. So when we talk about company culture, employee experience, it's always about understanding the people and then using that to create something that is very compelling for them, very engaging for them. So I think we have, we have covered it, I think, a lot. But <laughs> or people, we can do another show later. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, people at work. Who else should we talk to, let's say, in, within this topic? Mm -hmm. Who else should we talk to? And then outside of this topic, who else would we, should we talk to? Mm. Two people. Interesting. That you in would Vietnam. recommend. Uh, in Vietnam, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the show's not global yet. <laughs> hey, why not? You're sitting in a studio. It could be, That's your guest true. could be anywhere, Remote right? work. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Tan Viet from Anfa Bay, she has really been, I think she even chose Chief Happiness Officer as her official title. Mm. She really has been very spirited in the last couple of years about what work could be like. Rather than what is it and just accept it for what it is, I think she's really been focused on how do we create something that makes people happy, which steps into all the things we were just yeah. talking about, like you know what motivates people, what drives people, right beyond uh, the maybe... The coffee machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to say salary, should, but we, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think, like, yeah, she is really, really wonderful to talk to um, and, uh, and get an opinion from. Outside of that, I mean, I would have suggested you, but you're already I'm, on the I'm other right side here. of the table. Tuan, can you interview yourself? <laughs> can you do, like, one where you, like, Two go bikes. back and forth? Yeah. <laughs> Trump or Biden, Tuan? You have to choose. <laughs> I refuse to answer. I, I'm actually American. There you go. There you go. So you actually should have an opinion on that. I do, but that's not for the show. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, okay, okay. Who else do you think we should talk to? Yeah, so I, so I think about like true creative thinkers, right? I think about you and Josh from Rice. Yep. As people who are really looking at, you know, what's possible and, and maybe where can we go? Like I would say, those two people. If you cannot interview yourself, maybe you can interview Josh. Uh, I just saw him at lunch. Okay. <laughs> there. Sure, sure. <laughs> there you go. Um, um, that's it for us today. I want to thank our guest, Dan Van Rossum from Dreamplex um, to talk about the future of work. It's been illuminating. 
I think it's very useful for small business owners like myself uh, and even established companies to look at employee engagement in a way that maybe they haven't um, been aware of before. And if they were, maybe don't know how to approach. So I, I think it's been very, very useful. And I think for our guest who is on the other side of this conversation, the target of these employee engagement programs, uh, it'd be interesting to know the kind of things that companies think about when they hire you, when they retain you, and when they try to develop you. You can follow our podcast on YouTube, on uh, TikTok, Spotify, Instagram, Facebook, on Vicetra.com. Um, you can follow The Lab at The Lab Saigon uh, on Instagram and TheLabSaigon.com. We'll be reposting the content on our platforms as well as Vicetra's. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for having me. I was very honored to be either the first or the second <laughs> guest on the podcast. <laughs> Look, I think we, we talked about this at length. There's just a huge opportunity for companies to look at what they're doing and if it could be better. And I think we're always happy to be part of that discussion. I think the most important thing is that we think about the fact that we are talking about people and that we make work something to enjoy rather than endure. Peace. Listen to the full audio version of this podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts.